So we're on a journey at the moment through Corinthians today, doing Corinthians 10, and I'm going to read for us, and then we just unpack the scriptures, and again, I just want to remind you that the purpose why I believe God has asked me to preach this to the church is not only because it's the word, but I believe that God directs his people not only through the stability of his word, but a word in season that you might be able to be prepared and ready for what is to come. And so I believe some of what is happening here is not what is to come, what is required of the church right now, and also for what is to come. So let's read here. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So that's an interesting intro there, because it sounds positive and upbeat and yes and then he goes and then God wasn't pleased with most of them that's like a pfft. so there's a reason for that I believe is in this day and age I would like to know who has restricted access to a Bible who doesn't have a Bible you know some of the kids and I said to them no my dad hasn't bought me one and I ask him okay do you have a phone he goes yes okay then you've got four free Bibles available to you I don't want to hear nothing about I don't have access to a Bible. Olive Tree is a great app, but on there you can get four free Bibles and you can just immerse yourself in the Word of God. So everyone has the same measure of access. Our food is the same. What God's called us to eat, what He's called us to do, and then Jesus for everyone. No one is excluded. Just because I have prejudice towards somebody doesn't mean that it's God's prejudice. If God had prejudice, there would be no reason for John 3.60. For God so loved the whole world. And these ones. Whichever ones you are, the love of God is for all. Say all. All and all. Like wool and all, but better. <laughs> Is it? Oh, Patrick, yeah. So Philippians 2, 12 to 13 is a reminder for us in this present day, which is, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation. But doesn't your Bible say, the pastor? Doesn't your Bible say guru? Doesn't your Bible say the app that tells me how to live? But it says who? Say me. Eka. There's a, a questionnaire that went out to, to my son. Well, the kids at the school had to fill it in. And so they asked questions like, what does your dad do? And then they asked him, why? It's, what is your dad's favorite word? What is the word he uses the most? He said, viti. <laughs> now this is an internal thing because you know I always joke around with different words and things that sound funny to me you know so I don't sport with anybody I sport with everybody there's a big difference yo and in this thing I would say to Wyatt like he would say dad what is this and I say viti and then he would say dad viti so he went to school and told the teacher viti <laughs> now I'm sitting there and I'm thinking what is this teacher thinking when I a son comes with a VT. So you cannot stand before God and say VT. Okay, that's the point. Is you have the word of God, the responsibility to read the word is whose? Mine. Yeah, mine, 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 mine. Verse 6. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. Or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. 
nor should we put Christ to the test as some of them did and then died from snake bites. Things happened to them as an example for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Did I skip it? Ah, it's not really that important. <laughs> what are you guys doing now? You guys are grumbling as some of them did, isn't it? <laughs> Fell into that one. Yeah, come grumble, yeah? So, how we live matters. The Bible would not have been written if we didn't have, if we didn't have a part to play. We need more than the equivalent. We need more than the spiritual equivalent of one, two, three. I block myself. Honestly, I think some of us live like this. We take it right to the line, and what these guys are saying here is, what you saw in the Old Testament is a reality for us now. Why we should be living differently is not that you and yourself have this incredible ability to avoid what they did, but it is now in Christ Jesus I can do all things, which means that which I couldn't abstain from before, I now can abstain from in my own strength. In Christ Jesus who strengthens me, These are not sayings, this is a lifestyle. And the church has to realize that not by intent, but by design, we have been living our lives based on seer, dinger, seer dinger, sayings. That's why the Bible reminds us that they will know you by your, so we know all these things, man. Mecca. So now what I want to clarify is put to the test. So this test is like in Malachi where it says, the tenth, you bring it into the storehouse and there'll be blessing. Test me on this. That test is because God is saying, what I say, I deliver on. Guaranteed. If you're not experiencing that, I promise you the recipe that is incorrect is this side. That should be your absolute guarantee. When it's not working out and you are, like quoting scripture, and you can do it in Swahili already, but you're not seeing what it says you should have. You need to inquire, God, what do I need to do differently? And this, the Holy Spirit, the counselor, will come and teach you. This testing is the one when why it winds down the window, winds up the window, winds down the window, winds up the window, winds down the window, and I say, why stop it now. Or when Annika, joking. So don't, don't test God in that way. Don't see how far you can sin before the hammer comes down. Because you know, a good father disciplines his son. For parents, actual parents in this room, do not follow what the world says how you should raise your children that will lead them to death. Follow the word of God. I sit with my son yesterday, he's five, and we're busy talking about discipline, and I take him to Proverbs, and I say to him, look what the Bible says. He can't read, so then I read it for him. And I say to him, why it it says here that a good father takes the rod to his son. If I do not do it, I hate you. And he says to me, you know what, Dad? I need a hiding every once in a while. So don't come tell me it's nonsense. Follow the word of God so that it might reproduce life in your children. I'm not saying lead with that, because what I also brought to him as I said to him, you know what, Wyatt? What the Bible says to us is this. Do not discipline your children in anger. Because if you discipline your children in anger, it reproduces rebellion in them. Why that happens is because you're tackling their identity. And when you discipline them, what you're doing is you're correcting their actions, not them. There's a very big difference between the two. So now I explained to him and I said to him, sometimes dad is agitated and then I speak to you. Will you please forgive dad for those? That is incorrect. The discipline that you need to receive is consequence for action. He gets it. He's five. So remember that is how God will be with you and I. If he loves you, especially if you've made these prayers and you go, Lord, I give you my life. Do with me whatever you want to. Uh-huh. And then we wonder what's happening. We go, Viti. 
So look to God. God does not keep what he's doing in your life a mystery. You know, when he said, I'll leave you my Holy Spirit, that was so that you would know what's happening. Not so that you can play Russian roulette. Your life matters. Your life matters because of the price that he was prepared to pay for it. Ne, Diva. Ne, Captain Blue. So the end of the age. I want to say this. If we're not at the end of the age, we surely are feeling closer than ever before. Our potential for being deceived is a lot higher than what we want to acknowledge. Hear me on this. A lot of people, when they sit in my office, and I am not excluded from this, much of what I share with people is out of the the journey of discovery with God for myself. That's where the words come from, not by intent, but by design. I cannot think of any person that's ever come into my office that has taken the time, energy, and effort to sit there that is not giving 110%. But if you're supposed to go south and you're going north, where are you going to end up? The wrong place, heading in the wrong direction. Some of you technical guys are going, well, the earth's round and eventually, but forget that. Be like Elon Musk, north out to space. Okay. So safeguard your interactions. Allow the word of God to be the rock that you build upon. Nothing else, nothing more. I want to say to those of us that are studious, if your energy into education particularly around your journey in Christ, is more in books and daily readers, change that recipe. If it's more on blogs and listening to pastors like this, change your diet, more Bible, more Holy Spirit led than the other. You have a purpose and a plan in God that is waiting for you to deliver, and you're only going to get it from him. You're not going to get it from Joyce Myers, Rick Joyner, whoever you listen to. Okay, verse 10. If you think you're standing strong, Be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand when you are tempted. He will show you a way out so that you can endure. So we've heard that saying that pride comes before a fall. And what I'd like us to consider is arrogance is counterfeit confidence. Arrogance is counterfeit confidence. Arrogance is demonic in nature. Its armor bearers are pride and fear. And many of us, because of what I mentioned about how we've been raised, is when you've been chastised in anger, what it does is it reproduces pride and fear. But when you've been disciplined in love and there's been consequences of actions, your identity has been intact. You've been taught the ways that you you to live and you have obeyed or you've had the privilege of being raised where it says, train them in the way they should go and they will not depart from it in the positive sense. Confidence gives me the grace to learn what I don't yet know. It also gives me the ability to humbly serve myself and others with what I do know without reservation. There's a cultural thing in South Africa. If I ask who's a good plumber here, and there's 10 good plumbers, not a one of the good plumbers will stick up their hand, but that one Yahoo that did it for five seconds and watched the YouTube clip, he'll stick up his hand and come to your house. That is pious pride. There's a sense here of saying, I know who I am. I know what I can deliver. I hear from God. He says, help this man. And I say, I'm a plumber. I can help you. That's the way that that God's people are to live. They're full of confidence, the fear of the Lord, and they execute that with humility. Not a sense of like, I don't know. I think I hope this is encouraging for you. You I put in the jokes, but the reality is what I'm trying to put us in is that in Christ, we have everything that we need. The word of God is available. We have all that we need. It's only our belief system that stands in the way of where we need to go. And we need to sow to that correctly so that we might reap exactly what it is that we need. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Sometimes I think in this loftiness, we kind of think we're exempt from certain things. Well, I don't have that in my life. You know, we need to watch our self-talk because the minute you say that, you are just so away from something else triggering you. 
Because the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of the earth. And what they are doing is they're looking to undermine what God is wanting to do through you and Christ that has been established in you and I. Do not give him a foothold. Do you have any sin in you? If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. So here's something is when we compare with others, it removes our ability to be completely submitted under Christ. Because what we're doing is we're saying, well, so long as I'm better than that guy. One of my friends um, is very practical and pragmatic, but the advice is maybe not so neighborly, but it has an element of truth in it. Saying, you know, your alarm system doesn't have to be the best in the world. It just has to be better than your neighbor's. So now if you're a Christ follower, you know, there should be something of actually what is from God, under God, what do I have faith for, how should I live, and others around me should be benefiting from that. So when you're looking to the left and you're looking to the right, it should be for the purposes of learning and growing and not measuring identity, value, and worth. We should follow King David's lead here, Psalm 51.4. Before you and you alone, O oh God, have I sinned, and I have sinned in my life. Christ, you saved me. Many of us do not understand Christ the sustainer. For surely the one that saved you, that knew you were full of sin, both through born into sin, the sin that you're living in this life, can also see into the future the sin that you did today and the sin that you did tomorrow. And he says, still, I have chosen to reveal myself to you that you would be mine because I have a grace for a future grace for you because in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation that you can live free and move towards him, celebrating the justification that you have received. That's how we to live. But there's a self-talk that comes in. There's, there's instructions in the Bible for the safeguarding of a human being. And when he says, take every thought captive, it means, all of them. And when we do not have the word of God as an absolute in our life, the minute there was an opportunity to grumble about verse 10, we took it, hey? It's just instantaneous like this. And I use that one because, I mean, it's a joke. But think of the things in your life. The minute something comes along, there would be that taking every thought captive. Lord, I repent for this. We acknowledge the condition that we're in. Lord, I repent for this. But I proclaim you as the one that did it. And we declare the goodness of God, bringing ourselves into alignment. But then add this, because that's what you can do. But there's something that none of us can do, which is the most important is in those moments that God comes and meets you. When we come into agreement with God, it facilitates God moving into the areas of our lives that were previously positioned in sin against God. So the minute we come into agreement with God, he can move in faster and get us to where we need to go. How does temptation get the better of us. You know, because in my own life, through the years, there's been things that I just have not been able, able to overcome. And then I'd read the scripture, and then I think to myself, I feel so condemned, because how many times do we have to walk around this mountain? And so I want to leave you with these two keys. I believe we can look in two places as a start. First, it's an idol. And we can't see because we're blinded by deception. The second one is unbelief. We believe that it has the ability to, to give us what we need. This is not a Keith space to fix. So the part that I would get stuck on is I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to do it. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says, I can do all things in I, who strengthens I. So what I'd want to suggest is if you're going around the mountain, there's deception, it's possibly an idol, and there's unbelief. And so the one that saved you, now you need to go to the one that sustains you. Because in spite of this, 
He has never rejected you. Because the one that saved you knew where you would be today. And if he didn't want you, he would have did it then, not now. Why? Because that when God calls you, it means he in himself has a faith in himself to sustain you. You you have to sow towards that theology in order for him to come and rescue you. Especially as a guy, we are conditioned to be the heroes that kick open the front door, walk out with Barbie over the shoulders and get her to where she needs to be. But for each man, that would be the expression to your wife and to those around you. But before the king, he needs to rescue you and I. We have to get to the king. If you're a man of God, you can be strong like this, but over here you need to be like this. You need to be able to lay yourself before the king that he can come and minister to your heart. The depths of God that the love of God needs to fill is not only for you, but it's for your wife and your children in order to benefit them and all mankind. Otherwise, if the love of God is not in you, how can it flow through you? And those are not the places that we find them at, at places of war. We find them in the chambers of our king. He has the ability. We need to develop a faith that he has the ability to give us what we need. Amen. So, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourself if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? What am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I'm saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. What? Do we dare to rouse the Lord's jealousy? Do you think we are stronger than he is? So the question here is, what is an idol? And one of my mentors, Tim Keller, who recently passed this year, described it like this. He said, it is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you, seek to, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. This is something that I'd say that no idol before God can stand. And this free gift that Christ has been given so that this beautiful picture is our reality. That with Christ's death and resurrection, we are now in Christ as Christ is in the Father, and he dwells in us. There's no place for an idol. And so when he's talking about anything that absorbs your heart, you know, sometimes for me, I love to do this. I love to meet people. But the passion that I have for meeting people and and serving God and helping them connect with God, the question I have to ask myself, and I give you this as a personal means to assess yourself, out of 10, How much do you love your business versus how much love do you have for God? Not what you know to be the right answer, but assess in the heart. Is it a 3 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10? And then you do what we said before. We go to God. We submit to him. We repent for what? So that you might receive healing. Lord, I repent. In Christ, the sustainer will make the exchange. But the question we have to ask ourselves, do we want to, in pride, try to get there? Or will we express humility to bring ourselves before him and let him do the work in us? Christ glorified. That's what it means. He does the work in us. Flee not. Flee, sorry, flee is not used lightly. It should be our clue for not messing around with it. Get rid of it. Do not entertain it. Fast before it consumes you. Because the enemy comes to lie and he says, it can hang around. It's fine. You're doing all right. You're doing all right. It's fine. He lulls you into a false sense of security and then he goes, bah! (laughs) 
Jokes, that's just to make sure nobody's sleeping in the background. As a, as a saint, you have partaken of the new covenant. So I want you to go, take me to those scriptures that I sit here right at the bottom, please. I feel this is pertinent, possibly for somebody or some bodies sitting here. You know, quickly to give you this, I think when we consider in Africa, we often put a lot on people that are black or of this country, tribal, and then we look down on them as far as the engagement with ancestral worship, etc. So what I want to do today is say to you that I am of Scottish heritage, and the Elliots were Druids, which is the same as a witch doctor or Sangoma in South Africa or Africa. So the practices of demon worship is not a race thing. It is not to do with color. It has to do with worship, power, and what it can do for you. And so when he's talking over here, I want to draw your attention to, um, let's look at um, John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard and will tell you about the future. So King Saul is in a tough spot. God is against him. So he goes to a medium and he calls up, what's the guy's name? The prophet? Samuel, to speak to him. So the people that say that doesn't exist, if you read your Bible, you know it's in there. So these people are drawing from a very real power, and it's possible to communicate, but the word says that it is absolutely not acceptable to do that. And when you do that, you don't open yourself up to God, you open yourself up to the demonic, and they will wreak havoc in your life. Because the sins of the Father are poured out in the generations. I've had to pray certain things, not because Christ isn't powerful enough to do it in salvation, but there are contracts that the enemy goes and he's able to read the blood almost like somebody that can do a forensic audit. And he goes, I see this thing over here. I'm going to call this up. Let's test and see if this believer truly understands the new covenant that they have. And only if the believer understands that the new covenant supersedes the demonic rebellion previously, will they actually be able to say, ah, thank you for revealing this. I come this. Matthew 5, 25, agree with the accuser. My family did this. I repent. I take personal responsibility. And I say to you, get lost in Jesus' name. You no longer have any authority in my life because the blood of Jesus Christ supersedes all previous contracts that I have. And the new covenant that I have, that partner will sustain this relationship. Amen. So that's how you deal with these things. So if you are considering doing a little bit of this and doing a little bit of that, I'm telling you, you can't mix it. You will bring hell on earth in your life and in your family's life. The one who has been assigned to us to tell us what we need to know is the Holy Spirit, the pure spirit, where there is nothing that comes upon you but the blessing of God when you interact with him. All right. I think I'm going to skip those scriptures so it doesn't Take up from the time. I think you get the point there. I just thought that it was very, very important that you cannot mix the two and that it's not a cultural thing, that if we are looking to worship, it must be those that would worship in spirit and in truth. Twenty-three. You say... I'm, allowing, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you, this meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. This meat was offered to an idol. Don't eat it. I'm reading over the words, am I? (laughs) Don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscience for you, but it is for the other person. For why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? 
So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. I too try to please everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. I once before gave this example, and I remind you of it, is sometimes because we don't have the freedom in something, we don't realize that there's such a fullness in God available to us that we operate like wild animals that have been put into a caged environment. And so we walk the fences like this. And the earth around where we walk is hard already. But not realizing that there's like 15,000 square kilometers open, lush, green grass adventure to be had in God. And it's amazing and it's spectacular. But we want to camp on this thing that I believe I can do and there's no condemnation in it. But it's not bringing me any life and I have to defend it. Well, what use is that? Just get rid of it. Why do you need it? Ask yourself that question. Why do you actually need this and why do you need to defend it? Rather, could I suggest this? How is your life positively influencing others? I'd want to say, you know, this is my personal challenge because I get to spend a lot of time with different people. If I spend a lot of time with people, I start asking myself this question. How is this person growing that's around me? If I cannot see growth in the person around me, my question starts to saying, what do I need to do differently? There's a way of living that you're looking your life would actually be beneficial to others because you already have all that you need. It's a different way of living, isn't it? So let's commit to living life full. And living in a way, how can I benefit others? And so something that we'd have to safeguard against, you know, is when he was talking here, he is speaking to those whose identity, value, and worth are intact. Because if I have a sense that I need people's approval, then I would adjust, which is not what he's asking us to do, based on people's acceptance of me. Peter was rebuked with this because he wasn't standing firm in who he is in Christ, and he got intimidated by who he was with, and so he felt susceptible to this. He's not talking about that. He's saying because you have all you need in Christ, when you move in amongst people that do not yet have what you have, would you serve them in a way that is beneficial? Not defending what you can do, what you may do, but would you be able to lay that down so that when you're there, Christ in you can flow through you, they too might become the beneficiaries of this incredible faith that you have. Who wants to live like that? Amen. Sowing is where we reproduce. Not plowing and not defending, sowing. So I put this as a challenge to you. Consider in your life, in this week, where are you sowing? Where are you sowing in your life? Where you are sowing in the lives of others? So that in due season, what you have sown, you will reap. And what we're trusting is that a fruit that is worthy of worship for the king that is most high would be on display. Amen. Father, we just thank you that this morning we have encountered your truth by your word. And Father, for those that are really just eager and desiring for a transformed life, a change and encounter and experience with you, I pray for those that as they would lay down their lives before you, Father, thank you that in every area, every remembrance that I can think of and every circumstance in the Bible where your sons and your daughters have come before you and you've asked and they've given you the right into their hearts, into a space. You've made an exchange where they've always been better. There's always been an increase, a better revelation of you, a better understanding of you, an ability to fulfill that which you've called us to do. So I pray for those that are hungry this morning. I pray for those that are sitting there going, well, not me. I pray, Father God, that the Spirit would come in the gentleness and the kindness of God into those spaces, that they could see themselves as you see them. Father, they could be undressed with a demonic that suppresses them and holds them down. But the freedom of Christ would come now in Jesus' mighty name for your glory, for your glory in Jesus' name. I thank you for this. Amen. Part of our responsibility of elders is to help lead the meeting. 
I want to say that verse 10 was not Keith. That was a blinder. And it was done to him that he wouldn't see it because it's a ruling principality today. Complaining is a ruling principality today. And complaining is opening the door to a destroyer. And I believe what the enemy wants us to do is to make a joke of verse 10. But I'm saying to you, it's not a joke. I had an encounter with people today, this last week that I saw through their complaining the destroyer had absolutely destroyed everything that they had. When I was in Zambia, this is a word, when things weren't going our way, and God came to me and said to me, your complaining will open the door to the destroyer in your life. And so what I want to ask you, are you a complainer? The problem with us as South Africans, complaining is a means of communication. We communicate complaining, but we don't realize it. Stop it today. You stop it today. Don't blame the enemy. If you're, you know what blaming does? It makes you accept it, but it destroys trust. And so many of us don't trust through our own complaining. We're doing it to ourselves. It's not the devil. Stop it. I speak to you like a father would speak to children. You have been positioned for increase and prosperity and much more for the glory of God. But complaining only glorifies what you're dissatisfied about and the one you're complaining about. And Jesus is not in the picture. I want to break that off for you today. If, if you agree with me, I cannot do this if you do not agree with me. But to break it off of you, you must take responsibility first. I'm a complainer. Man, I realized I was a complainer. You know what complaining does? It makes me look good. It makes you look bad. But it doesn't glorify God. Anybody, anybody in this groove with me? Does anybody feel like, hey, he's talking about me now? Christ has come to set the captives free, to heal the brokenhearted, that the lame would walk, the blind would see, and the deaf would hear. And this day, this day, with what the enemy tried to do here to get us to laugh about something that is so serious, we say no. So what does the Bible say we do? Submit to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. So when you start hearing the, um, like when you're walking into the airport and you've got a suitcase and the wheel is squeaking, gee, 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 and so when you listen and you hear your complaining, that little suitcase of yours, gee, gee, what do you do? You submit to God. You resist the devil. You say, no, complaining. I will complain no more. You see, complaining takes away gratitude. Com complaining takes away praise. Complaining takes away the satisfaction that you have in Christ. Complaining is a hard condition. Do you understand with me? There's two things we're going to do. We're going to pray for Keith after this. But what, what I want you to do, that Afrikaans, um, is it a, uh, what is it, mosquito yach? What is that thing? Is it a poem or what is it? And so, your fabun, excel your cray. And so you have him. You have that spirit of complaining but there's a demon assigned to you to continue keeping you claiming, uh, uh, complaining. And so there's this, because of who Jesus is, I want you to get a smile on your face. Because when we find sin, the first thing we do, and that's what we've been learning this morning, the first thing we do, we find satisfaction in Jesus. Because this too was paid for on the cross. And so the first thing you do, delight yourself in him. This too, you've paid for on the cross. That I can get a breakthrough from this thing, and this thing has no hold on me anymore. And this is just traditions that we've learned that we need to break. But demons will keep us in it. Because what it does, it takes us to self-pity. And it's the pity 
self-pity demon that keeps you and I complaining and makes us look more important than what we should. So, Father, we come right now, and we take responsibility for our lives, and we say that when we see what Jesus has done, Lord, and we, and we, and we look at what the meal was saying, the Lester, it is finished, it is done. The work has been done for us. When you look at the scripture that Ricky was sharing, if you go to the parable of the seeds, the only reasons why the seeds never took root, uh, took, grew, is they never had a root. And so complaining is a bitter root of bitterness. And where there's bitter envy, there's misunderstanding, confusion, and every evil thing. Have you, have you been noticing when you're complaining that there's misunderstanding, confusion, and every evil thing? Because it's, that's what bitter envy is. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come and we, we pluck out, in the name of Jesus and the power of the blood, that bitter root of envy. And we choose to be rooted and established and built up in Christ as our root. We choose to be rooted in him, in Jesus' mighty name. So bitter root of envy, confusion, misunderstanding, and every evil thing, go right now in Jesus' mighty name. Tell it to go. You unclean spirit, go from me right now. Say it, address it, speak it out loud. You unclean spirit, go from me right now in the name of Jesus. You are not my friend. You're my enemy. You may console me, but you defile me. Go from me in Jesus' mighty name. The scripture was talking about defilement. Mm, thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, as Keith was saying, that is so powerful. It cleanses me. It washes me. It purifies me of this defilement right now. And so, Lord, now that I've submitted to you, Lord, now that I've resisted the devil and his wiles and his scheme, I invite your love and truth. And so pray with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I invite your love and your truth and come and speak to me now. 